So Nozick notes in in the beginning of the essay that there are – when you ask the question, why do intellectuals oppose capitalism, um, there are two approaches to answering it and he's really only concerned with one and I think we should be clear about that up front. So the first one is the – could be rephrased as what reasons do intellectuals give for being opposed to capitalism? So this one would be answered along the lines of capitalism hurts the poor or leads to inequality or isn't as – good and wonderful and utopian as socialism. So if you were to ask an intellectual, what do you think is wrong with capitalism? These are the reasons they would give. That's not what Nozick is interested in here. Um, he is interested in the second way of looking at this question, which is how do intellectuals come to hold those views? And so it's – that's how this schooling enters in is because the – the forces at play that he thinks are pushing them towards socialism and away from capitalism are taking effect before we even get to them holding views about socialism and capitalism. This is stuff that's happening from when they're you know, elementary school kids on up, that there's, there's certain things they're exposed to that then when they eventually get to the question of what economic system is best, influence how they think about it. Um, and he's concerned about this question also that – like because it's it's more than just an interesting like here's a group of people who seem to disproportionately lean a certain way why he's he's concerned he thinks this answering this has weight because intellectuals and especially wordsmith intellectuals are very influential in society that they f shape the opinions of non-intellectuals of most other people in society in a way that other categories of people don't. Yeah, I think it's worth uh, this bringing up as a point of reference, as a footnote uh, to your point that that's also in Hayek's view, the intellectuals in society, which was his essay where he explained how he thinks you change the world. He was interested in influencing what he called secondhand dealers and ideas, which were uh, the intelligent people, including lawyers and journalists and things like this. Not necessarily the Nobel Prize winning professor, but the people who talk about the Nobel Prize winning professor's work, uh, who influence the people around them there in when they go to bars and when they have dinner parties. And he said we have to get those people to believe in capitalism before. We can really change the world, and so it's, it, it's a, as a footnote. That's a similar type of thing. The people that he's focusing on, I think, in Nozick's essay is, is similar here. Right, right. Because uh, how many people actually sit down and read academic papers by Nobel Prize winners? Most people don't. They will read, though, popular accounts of those papers, and that's where that's where those secondhand dealers and ideas become very, very important. Now, uh, to get back to Nozick just a little bit, he says uh, he says in this essay that the schools are, quote, the major non-familial society that children learn to operate in, end quote. And that's, uh, that's, I think, very, very important because if you learn in school what society is like, then you will presumably think that school is what society should be like. When society turns out to be different from school, it will be evaluated as a failure. I want to I go more into that because – the most interesting thing that I find in this essay is the is the discussion of the value that the intellectual holds for himself. So you have this part in the value of intellectuals where he says, intellectuals now expect to be the most highly valued people in a society, those with the most prestige and power, those with the greatest rewards. Intellectuals feel entitled to this, but by and large, a capitalist society does not honor its intellectuals, which becomes a sort of weird type of projection of this to say, well, there's something wrong with a society that doesn't ad adequately value the things that are valuable. And I, this is the first point in the essay where I kind of wanted to push back at Nozick because I don't think our society fails to value intellectuals. I think they certainly get a very high level of prestige. Uh, maybe it's never enough. Uh, I know that Robin Hanson has said that uh, people are fundamentally motivated by prestige and that uh, more, than, more than money, more than almost anything, what people want is to be respected and loved by those around them, to be told that they're really important, to be told that society needs them. And we say this about we say this about our intellectuals. So, for example, uh, even in my relatively conservative family, if I were to say, "Hey, guess what? I got a tenure track position at Harvard," 
that would command respect. Now, they might say, oh, well, Harvard. <laughs> but, but they would still think, wow, he's really accomplished something. That's prestigious. That's important. And, uh, and you know, maybe, maybe uh, that's not enough, but it's something. And it's, it's certainly something on par with, uh, with almost any other significant form of prestige in our society. I can think of a couple of ways to maybe answer that from, from Nozick's perspective. Um, the, the first would be that on, on the broad level, for every Cornell West or for every Paul Krugman, there are countless intellectuals, countless people who did very well in school and went on to become professors or worse, adjunct professors oh, yeah. who are, <laughs> you know, on, on a relative level, not getting much acknowledgement, and they're especially not getting. I mean, they may get like your family might think it's it's really neat that you went to that you get a tenure track position at Harvard, but the broader society is not paying attention to that kind of thing. They don't know who the Harvard faculty are, except for the handful of very very famous ones. So there isn't a lot of prestige outside of your small circle, and then along similar lines. The, the kinds of people who have very broad level prestige, again, setting aside the handful, the very small handful of super famous academics are like the guys on Duck Dynasty um, <laughs> or you know, they're, they're sports stars or they're actors or they're occasionally – The Kardashians. Yeah, the, you know, people who inexplicably and there's – or they're, they're occasionally like famous businessmen or Steve Jobs or Bill Gates who – to the intellectual are decidedly not intellectuals and so perhaps not deserving of the kind of prestige. Well, I want to dovetail off that too because I think that Nozick's point is a little bit too inward facing to the intellectual himself about whether or not he's being valued enough. I think that matters. But I think that the other thing is was more what Aaron's point, the question of whether or not an intellectual thinks regardless of their specific place is more of a general proposition. Is the world valuing the right things correctly? Uh, that question, which is less, in, is the world valuing me correctly? I, I think that a, a, a humble, realistic intellectual who is the world's foremost authority on Rousseau uh, at Harvard doesn't probably think that th that should be the most important goal of society is to acknowledge that Rousseau experts are or the preeminent top rung. But he thinks that in general that the kind of things that intellectuals like to do, uh, whether it's contemplative life and not watching Duck, Duck Dynasty and listening to the symphony. So why do symphonies have to be supported with public money but these stupid screaming bands are supported with the market system? So the general question is whether – and I think this is a very, very important question in free market thought, which is the, the dichotomy between someone's perception of what's valuable and how they perceive the world as whether or not it is accurately valuing the valuable things. And in many ways, one of the reasons that Marxism is like a religion in many ways is because the – many religions say essentially the world is run by false values. Like the, the basic core bottom thing is that the world is run by false values. It should be piety and not money. It should be these and not that. Uh, Marxism says this too to some degree. A lot of political – you, you can always feel this idea in a lot of speeches that the, the point is that the world is being run by false values and we need to figure out some way to correct that. But to pull this back to – so when Nozick, he says you know, there's the two ways of answering the question. So what you're describing is that first way of answering the question. Like the intellectual can say, look, capitalism means a world based on false values. I think these are the correct values, therefore not capitalism. But to pull it back to that second version of the question, which is how did the, how did the intellectuals come about having these ideas and attitudes, that's where we get to the school because what he's saying is that because the intellectuals – were in this non-familial community, that the, the, the community they spend so much of their time in, that all of us spend so much of our time in, which is the school system as we're in our formative years, that that is a society that rewards intellectual kind of things, that you get praise from your teacher when you write the really good paper or you ask the smart question or you can articulate the answers in, in a way beyond what your fellow students can do. And so – and if you're the kind of person who does well in that sort of stuff, you like it. 
Um, and we tend to think that a society that we like is the right kind of society. Um, the society that makes us happy is the right kind of society. And so you come to think that the values that are important are the ones that happen to be praised, happen to be rewarded within the school system. And so then when you get out and you look at the society outside of it, that's when you start to say, well, that doesn't look like the school system, so there must be something wrong. Yes, and and one of the things that's I think key in understanding the market process and and you know so sort of sociology of the market is that if the market process is doing its job, if it's doing what it's supposed to do, a lot of its results are actually going to look random to any particular observer. They are going to look as if nothing of value has been provided. They're going to look as if uh, money has been distributed in an arbitrary fashion because what the market process does is to discover previously unknown knowledge. And when it does that, you didn't have that knowledge. By definition, you didn't have it. So your judgments about that are likely to be or have a good chance of being uh, false. You're going to think, aha, the market does things that are crazy and I have knowledge that enables me to, to make that judgment and I can judge it. Now, uh, what, what Hayek's insight into the market was is that, look, this is what it's supposed to look like. This is what it's supposed to look like when it's doing its job. And, and to some extent, those judgments are going to look arbitrary, the judgments that are, are, are bestowed by the market because what has happened is someone who happened perhaps simply by randomness to have that piece of knowledge when other people did not was able to monetize it. 